So this is where, this is actually the session I was going to do at the end, but I want to move it up because I think it might be kind of fun to kind of see some of the stuff I've been talking about. Um, this is called, this is actually called uh, thinking asynchronously. Uh, I think I messed up on the slide here, but so let's let's jump in here. So we're going to talk about the asynchronous versus synchronous when you're when you're building applications. Okay, so so how does it apply to the customer? And is and hopefully it'll kind of help you guys understand, uh, especially some of you guys that are building service applications already. How does a service application look, and in you know what what can it do? We'll, we'll jump into this a little bit. So you see this slide already? I showed it to you earlier. These are common patterns. But the specific one we're going to deal with here is the web apps and how this looks. Okay. So this is a little more specific example of a web application. It's a full-on serverless web application that you can build. It's supposed to stay in the camera. I think I came out. I'd love to go up in time. So. All right. Um, so here's the idea. Here's the services I'm using, and here's why. Okay. First thing I'm using is Amazon CloudFront, and I'm, I'm saving my data in a in a bucket. Now I can do a I can post directly out of a bucket without CloudFront by the way. Okay. All CloudFront does is distribute my content out as a, it's a CDN, it's a content delivery network. Okay. So it puts it all over the world, so it's closer to the user, right? Because when we deal with latency, one of the biggest things we deal with is getting our code closer to the user. So that's what the CDN does. But the code is going to be stored in a host bucket on S3. Okay. The second service I'm using is one on the bottom called Amazon Cognito. Anybody use Cognito? You guys mess with that at all? Okay. Amazon Cognito does a couple of things. First thing it does is it lets you create a, a, a user pool. You can create it. It's, it's a username, password. There you go. And then you can use that to uh, handle authentication and then authorization. And the cool thing about it is built right into API Gateway is what we call a uh, Cognito authorizer. Okay, so if you authorize through Cognito and apply the credit, right, uh, apply permissions, Amazon Gateway will validate that, and then in you go. So when you hit Amazon Gateway, it's going to check for the token coming from Cognito and give you access to the system based on what that token uh, on, on what your, your scope is. Uh, the other thing Amazon Cognito does is it handles uh, federated IDs. So if you want to tie into like a, a Facebook or a Google Plus or a, a, you know something else, a custom one, you can do that. Um, so it'll, it, and it ties those together. So very handy. I'm not gonna lie, it's pretty complex. Uh, trying trying to work with it. Did you guys find it complex or was it pretty straightforward? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I've been working there for a long time. And there's sometimes like what. So it's, it's, it's complex. Authentication can be complex. Doing it right, you know, it can, it can be tough because you really want to make sure it's locked down. And then, as you've seen already, kind of show today, back in is Lambda, and uh, the Lambda does my compute. That's where I do all my business logic, and then my database is DynamoDB. There's a pretty standard web application. So if you're building your front end, you could build your back end uh, on this. And again, you could do Python node. .NET Core, Java, um, all kinds of things. So, there you go. Any questions on this? Does this make sense? All right. So one of the common patterns we see, I just dropped those others so they're not in the way. This is the big Lambda approach, okay? So the big Lambda approach says one Lambda is gonna handle all my application. Now this works, and it's okay for small applications, but it can get pretty bloated. Uh, as, as, as our business logic gets complex, okay? So when I'm doing building that payment processing that I had or something like that, this gets, this gets pretty hairy because I've got, you know, 5, 10, 20, 100 billion lines of code. And sometimes it can be hard to maintain. So the other approach we see, and this goes back to what we were talking about earlier, is the mini Lambda functions approach. I don't know if that's a general name we use for, but this is a this is an example of a microservices architecture. So the idea here is I have an Amazon API gateway, and I can I can spread I can split across lambdas based on a resource. So I can say users hit this lambda, reports hit this lambda, however my endpoints are my API, right? 
Or I can even do it by method. So I could say user posts hit the top link, user gets hit the second link, or something like that. I can do it really granular with that, however I want to do it. I can also break down the authorization cognito on what can be reached and what can't be reached. Yes? You said that the request is one lender from another lender, right? Yeah. So yeah. how can I? I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna answer that as we go through that. That's a, that's a great question. So yeah, so because what happens is, uh, again, this is a single responsibility. You all familiar with the single responsibility model? Okay, good. It means, and as a lambda, the way we do that is we, we do one thing, and we do that one thing really well. And as I update, I can always update that one thing, okay? So that's a single responsibility model. It's easier to manage, log, logical splits like I just explained. However, uh, colors kind of bad. You can see that blue kind of bad color, right? But what happens when those want to talk to each other? Like, like you brought up, and then you brought up. So we can call. It is possible to call one lander from another. Okay, it, it absolutely works, and, and in most cases it's going to work fine. But it is a coupling effect. It ties those landers together. Okay, which you know the, the, the you know the land, we're not going to send out the Amazon police <laughs> to get you, but. I do encourage you to stay away from that pattern because, like, and it doesn't matter if you move serverless on AWS or you're building it within your own architecture at home or things like that. The more you decouple your microservices, the more resilient your website is. Okay, because you, you, you want to build so that if my last two lambda functions die, the rest of them continue to run just fine. Excuse me, one second. But. In general, when we try to build these, we say, that's eh, bad. Try not to do that. Okay? So, let's kind of show you an example of this. Okay, this is an example. This is a translation demo that I wrote that I built using uh, all the AWS translation services. And here's how it works. Okay? Can you all see that? It's just a little bit of data. All, all we're saying is it, it's, it's just a JSON object. And it's data, and it just says, hello, welcome to my translation demo, and it sends a culture. Because with browsers, we deal with cultures. And so your culture is usually two sets of digits. Uh, like for, for Russia, I think it's RU dash upper RU. So it tells you, hey, it's a Russian language in Russia. Uh, in English, we have English Great Britain, English America, English, you know, all, all over the place. So um, all kinds of things. So that's what it sends. Okay? And so here's what it's going to do. This is the big lambda function. So my user authenticates their Amazon Cognito, and you know the, the, the website you see is stored in the bucket. Okay, and I actually don't have authentication on this site I'm going to show you. So if you want to go out and play with it, you're welcome to. Um, but uh, it, each culture is sent to Amazon. So it comes in, and then this Lambda function breaks out each culture and sends the translation and that culture to an Amazon Translate. So if I have four cultures, then there's four requests to Amazon Translate. And then it sits there and it waits. So that, so that Amazon is, or that Lambda is active. Okay, and it's waiting. It's a synchronous call. When, I'm sorry, when it gets that data back, it then writes, uh, I'm sorry, it, it, it holds that data. We're almost kind of being state. The next thing it does is it takes each of those returned translations and it sends it to the service called Amazon Polly. Amazon Polly then turns those translations into an audio file and streams it back to, or a buffer back to the Lambda, okay? The Lambda then takes that return data and drops those as files into an audio file, okay? And then it gets a response back from there where those are sitting, and it takes all the data and stores it in DynamoDB, okay? So you see the steps that are going on here? Yeah. What happens here is there's all kinds of places where maybe this might break. Now, I'm going to tell you, Amazon is incredibly resilient, and their services run all the time, but everything breaks, right? Where in a says everything breaks. So let's say I got great translations, but uh, I hit poly, that worked, but then for some reason I couldn't write it all to the bucket, and the whole thing died. So one, I lost my translation. Two, I lost my audio files. And I've, I've got a problem now, okay? So I've got to get back to the client 
so you know, let's, let's get that again. I'm writing an error handling. You know, I've got a lot of error handling in here to make that make that happen. But all right, so let's so so when it's all done, what we call the happy path. If it works, then this is what we get. Okay, so we, we come to a point where uh, it's written out in in different records. So what I do, in the particular pattern I'm doing for database here, is that I'm writing the data. Uh, as each, each one is an individual record in the database, and uh, I have an original, which has all the cultures. I have the audio files, and the way you can tell those are audio files is by the type, and I have the translations. Now, in DynamoDB, and there's a little bit out of scope for what we're talking about today, but it, it, when you're doing NoSQL or DynamoDB, the way we, we use, we have what are called a hash and a range. So your hash is your ID, or you can have the two of them coupled together and make an index or make an ID. So the way I've got this is what makes this unique is the ID and the type together. And then I have a secondary key, a global, a global uh, secondary index called original ID. And it only writes that on the original so that when I actually want to get this for it to show on my web page, I can scan just that small index, it's called sparsity. Okay, I can grab just that small index rather than scanning the whole table every time. So a little bit of database uh, magic there. Uh, not really, I'm just very proud of it. So, and then in the S3 bucket here, I've got files that are written out that show uh, what those are. So let me actually show you this website. Quick one here. So that's the, and I'll put that back up in a minute, but that's, that's the actual website we're going to go to. There it is. Okay. All right. So, yes, I designed this. I'm very proud. This is my front end skills right here. I did the CSS, the JavaScript, all that kind of stuff. I'm not a designer. I actually started in the computer world as a designer, um, and, and I knew the tools. I know Photoshop. I'm good with CSS, all those kind of things. I'm just not very creative. That's just the truth. So there you go. That's my that's my design. All right. So let's say we want to grab something. So let me actually switch over. Let me make sure that she's there. Okay, so now this site is being hosted in US East 1. So it's actually in US. And because I'm the only one hitting it, my Lambda is asleep. So what you're seeing right now is what's called the cold start. And actually, actually, that's how we were seeing it. I was on the wrong page. So there we go. And there we love it. Okay. So if I went to Frankfurt, it'd be a lot faster. Um, all right, so what I'm able to do here is I'm going to create, let's go out and, I don't know, we'll, we'll go to Amazon.com. And we'll go to blog. Okay, so I'm going to grab, let me go to just one of our blogs here. And I'm going to grab some text, okay? So let's grab this, go back to my site, do create new, Joe, and uh, let's see what happens. Okay, I'm going to choose all the languages, so I can actually choose all the languages, and here's what I'm going to do. So again, what it's going to do before I hit translate is it's going to go get translation, for each of these cultures, so there's like 20 something cultures there. Then it's going to send each one out to, to Polly to be translated to an audio. It's pretty good size file, or pretty good size text. And then it's going to save it all to, to uh, S3, or the, the audio files to S3. It's going to save it all to a database. So let's go ahead and hit this. And we're waiting. Okay, so while we're waiting, uh, this is what our customers see. So at this some point, your customer is probably going to be like, this is a synchronous call, okay? So it's blocking call. So the customer, customers now when we're working with them, they're thinking this is broken and, and okay, now it's done here. All right, so let's go. This is the one I just did right here. Okay, so now, oh, that's not the one I did. There we go. The second one? Yep, this is oh, it. Yeah. 
Okay, so then there. So it worked. Okay? So that's a really embarrassing it didn't work, right? So it worked. So we, we translated it to a bunch of different ones. Let's uh let's find the Russian. See if our see if our translation's any good. Are you good? Okay, so I can, let's see if we've got some volume here. Технические и евангелистки часто путешествуют. Вопрос номер один, который мы получаем от клиента в представлении Amazon Translate, поддерживает представление Amazon. Why are you laughing? Did you say something funny? Translate. Oh, yeah. So it's not perfect science yet, right? So, okay, but see there. So, so when we're working with websites, you're building front of websites. When you have your customers sitting and waiting 20, 30 seconds, they think it's broken and they move on, generally. Or they refresh, or they throw you know, ah, what's going on? Okay? So what we need to start doing, and it's not just for websites, it's for general architectures uh, as we're building, you want to start thinking asynchronously. What can be done after the fact? While the client's not waiting, or while we're doing other work, what can we do that's not a blocking call? Okay, so let's reevaluate this. So let's look at this translation demo again, but instead of doing it synchronously, let's look at what asynchronous. Okay? So um, we have several options that we can do, and, and I talked about them uh, earlier when we were talking about the different patterns and things like that. I can use uh, simple notification service, simple queue service, Kinesis data streams, or our new service called Amazon Event Bridge. Okay? Uh, so in this one, we're particularly going to use Amazon Event Bridge. And we're going to use DynamoDB, but DynamoDB under the hood uses Kinesis to handle its stream. Okay, so what this means is I write data. Actually, I'll just show you the demo and then it'll make more sense. Okay, I'm also going to use a trigger based off of, of Amazon Simple Storage Service. Okay, so let's, re, let's readdress this architecture. Okay, so we've got, uh, again, we're back to this that we talked about. So instead of us doing it all with one lambda, here's what we're going to do. Our user sends the same data, same exact data in, and it hits, a, it hits the Amazon Gateway API endpoint, uh, and then it, the first thing it does is it writes that data to a DynamoDB. Okay? There's some things to know about DynamoDB. Uh, number one is the minute you write the data, there's, there's a very little latency in it, it's written to six places. Now, uh, the six places, how it does it, it writes it in two places in three of what we call availability zones. That means literally different physical places. Okay? So, it, when it writes that, it only gets to like five and comes back, and then it'll automatically under, underneath it with it up. So, if I lost one of the uh, availability zones, I still have your data and I'm still up and running. Okay? So, what you know here is your data is incredibly reliable. I've immediately written the data, and I haven't lost anything. So even if the rest of the thing breaks down, I don't have to go back to the customer and go, what do you want me to do again? I have that data in my system, and I can write a, maybe a cron tab uh, with the lambda to come through and check every hour, say, hey, I've got this, but do I have translation to it? Okay? So the first thing I'm going to do is the data is going to be written to DynamoDB. Now, what happens with DynamoDB is it has a stream on the back side. Okay? Basically, when, whenever data is written to DynamoDB, it writes a stream out the back of it. Of, it's basically a log of what's happened. Okay? And I can trigger a lambda. I'm going to call it the stream reader. I can trigger a lambda to do something with that. Because remember, all it is, it's an event. right? And so then we're triggering the lambda. So the lambda then takes, just like in the other one, it takes and it breaks out the different, uh, different cultures, and it submits those jobs. It doesn't submit directly to translate. It submits those into EventBridge. Okay? So here's, let me explain what EventBridge does. EventBridge is it's a bus. It's, it's a bus of events. It basically says, Here's what's going on. Here's a pipe of things going on inside of your account. 
Okay, you can create a custom bus. You can say, hey, this is just what I'm going to use for this application, or you can use the default one. Everybody has one. And so it's, it's kind of like an SNS, but what happens is I put all my events into the bus, and then I can write rules that read from them. Okay, so and I'm going to show you those. I'm actually going to jump, jump in when I'm through this demo, I'll show you the code that does it. But it says anytime I have something that matches, grab that and do something with it. Okay? So that's that's what a grim fridge does. Um, very handy. So what I'm doing is I'm writing custom events to the fridge. And then I have another lambda on the back side that has a rule that says, hey, anytime there's a translation request being made. So when when stream reader up here puts an event into the event bridge, it says this is a translation request. Okay. Anytime that translation request is triggered or found in the event bridge, it's going to trigger this lambda. He's going to do just what we said before. He's going to get a translation and write data back to DynamoDB. Okay. Anybody with me on that? Any, any confusion or questions? So let me ask you this. If I'm writing data back to DynamoDB, what do you think happens next? It will send another event to be bigger. That's exactly right. More data in DynamoDB. So it sends another event to Stream Reader, but this time Stream Reader says, no, that's not, that's a trend. It's already come. Here's a translation. So what do I need to do next? I need to create an audio event. So it writes another event to, to EventBridge that says, create an audio event. And this, this, which triggers this one, to actually grab that data and create an audio event. Now, funny thing about Polly is, in, the, in our last event, I had the lambda spin and wait for Polly to give me back the, the file, right? I don't have to do that. I can say to Polly, hey, here's the text, make an audio recording and drop it in a bucket, I'll see you later. Okay, that's an asynchronous approach to it, okay? So what, what I did here is this audio thing, getting the rule from a print bridge, it says, hey, make an audio recording of this text and drop it in a bucket and I'm moving on. Okay? So if you notice, endpoint lambda, stream reader lambda, translate lambda, and audio lambda are all very short bursts, right? Boom, do the job go away. Boom, do the job go away. It's very quick, okay? Finally, but I need to know, so once this, so once this, because I've written, I've already written my the original data and I've written the translation specs down on DB so far. Okay? Even if Polly blows up, I have the translations in the original one. Okay? So now I need to know when the files hit the audio button. Okay? So I can then do a trigger off the audio button. So when my I have a trigger on S3 that says when you get a file that's dropped in here, I want you to trigger a lambda. I want you to fire a lambda and pass it the data. So what happens is an S3 event, it says, hey, here's, I'm, it's, this is my bucket, here's a bucket name, and here's the key name, the file name, okay? Now do whatever you want to do. So finalize says, okay, I know where you are, so I'm going to write that to DynamoDB okay, as a separate record. So, what you've got here is rather than using one lambda that spins for as long as we saw it spin, we're going to use one, two, three, four, five lambdas that are all quick quits. Okay? Granted, more invocations, less time spent in memory. Okay? 400,000 gigabytes is what you have in memory each month free. A million events, what you have in, uh, I'm sorry, a million invocations. So you've got some room to play there. Right? And again, these are very quick. And you can, you know, there are different permutations you can do with this to reduce some of that. This is a very, I, I made this to be a very asynchronous example. Um, so let's take a look and see what that, how that works. So on this same website, I actually set it up, that, and it shows the architecture if you want to look at it. I actually set it up to handle both the synchronous and the asynchronous. 
Okay, so now we're going to take that same data. We're going to go back here. We're going to create new. Okay. Okay, ready? Here we go. And we're done. Okay, so now if I look here, Granted, the audio rendering isn't done, right? Because it's still still happening asynchronously after the fact. But my customer does not think it's broken. My customer's not waiting. They can move around the website, do whatever they want to do, and come back. Now, what's happening here? Oh, now it's done. What's happening here? I could have done this WebSocket where I would have got triggered and it would have updated. I didn't. I just did a worker, uh, not even do a worker, I just did a, a, a timeout where I check it. I take one, one minute and I check it every five seconds. After a minute, I shut it down. So whatever I did, should be done. Okay, you see the difference in the, the time the customer's waiting and the interaction? Now again, this is a website example, but you see how, how um, asynchronous tends to help out. So, and again, it's the same thing with this narrative. If I speak Arabic, Okay. Right, any questions on that? Does that make sense? Okay. All right, serverless guys, is this something you've ever seen before as far as thinking that way? Yeah, you can get uh, the previous slide. Yeah. And, uh, you want to go to the deck, to the slide deck? Uh, or the page? Uh, page. The slides. The oh, the slides, yeah. Just a moment. Saying is 
will this trigger off of, of uh, I'm going to come back to you. I think you're both on the same link, and I missed it. Uh, DynamoDB has a stream that triggers, okay? With, with what, you, if you're using uh, Aurora or, or MySQL, something like that, there's some manual effort that would need to be done on true. Um, I missed that part of the question. That's what you were driving at, wasn't it? Yeah, okay, so I missed that part of the question. I'm sorry. No, they don't have the stream, so there would be some manual work that would have to be done. What you could do is you could do Dynamo at first, but let's say, hey, I, I want this architecture, but I need my data to be in, in like, a, like a relational. You could write to a relational out of the stream, okay? So you, DynamoDB could be your fast I.O., okay, things are getting written and everything like that. But after the final one, you could trigger an event bridge again and write data out to a SQL server. Does that and make sense? What is this uh, manual working? Say again? What, what is this manual working? Was this manual, all the manual work? Well, so, so like uh, a thing database you choose to use, you would need to somehow trigger, like you pull it for changes and then trigger something rather than getting a stream like this. So this makes it very easy to just automatically happen. Um, but you could, you could, you'll pull for changes. Um, but my, my suggestion would be to write to this and then in the end have it, the last trigger writes to you. So do you have any questions? Okay. All right. Okay, good. Well, I, I completely blazed up when you said that. Yeah, let's go. Okay. Uh, all right. So. Let me ask, what do we want to add another step? Okay, so we've kind of talked about breaking these down, doing them so that we can do it, you know, in, 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 a, in an asynchronous way. This pattern makes it really easy to add more things. Okay, so for example, I want to use, I want to get sentiment analysis. So, so meaning uh, uh, with Amazon Comprehend, I can analyze text and figure out if they're mad at me or if they're happy with me. I take every text my wife sends to me and I run it through things on Comprehend. It helps a lot. Uh, you really can't do that. You can, you can figure out what is the basic attitude of the message that's coming through. Uh, so, you, so, uh, so I can do that. So what I can do, so this is back to our architecture, I can simply add in another string or another, or another rule. Okay? I can say, okay, add another rule that triggers a sentiment uh, lambda. That lambda should go uh, to Amazon Comprehend and grab the data and then write it back to the database. Okay, real easy. See all the architectures here. The other way, I would have had to go through all the code and I would have had to, you know, add another. Especially if you're doing Node, I would have had to do another callback or a promise or something crazy like that to add it in. But in this, so so what you're looking at, and, and I'm actually going to show you code on this, but what you're looking at is very small bits of code to make this work, okay? Rather than just, uh, well, you know, small in, in, in relation, but rather than three, four, five hundred lines on lambda, it's all broken out into separate lines. Questions on this? All right, yeah. From that page, you saw a web page that showed up the sometime other file to how was it? It was JavaScript in, in on that page that described the the date and everything. Oh, my website. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the the website is. We, we see here only the first request. Just to to make work done. Ah. Uh, but then how my browser gets the result? Okay. Okay. Every single other yeah. file. So yeah. So and that that's a good question. What I'm not showing up here is. Down in this blank area is I have what's called a get endpoint. So that's my post endpoint. Everything going through. I have a get endpoint that just reads from the database, and it just does that small that that secondary index to grab the main data. Um, and so my my browser just pings that about every five seconds, just to see if there's new data, and then it pulls it down. Yeah, and I should represent that here. I'm sorry, uh, I forgot about that. So all right. That, let me jump in here real quick so we are time wise. Okay. Sorry, one second. Yeah, so we're supposed to be in a two hour workshop, so we might end up going next one. All right, so. 
when you get into cloud nine, remove this, make it log in again. Anybody have access to their account yet? is I'm going to grab this. So what I'm doing is I'm grabbing copies of that code so I can show it to you real quick here. Several repos that, that uh, do this. Does anybody have, uh, if you've got access to your can you read me? Still nobody has access to it. Okay, one, two, three, four. What's that? I still can't see him. I can't see him. Still waiting? Okay, yeah. All right, so we, so we can't do the demo yet. So I want to take a moment to kind of show you what these what this, these applications look, at, look like. So the first thing we've got here, uh, is we've got the, uh, let's do the async or the synchronous backend. Okay, so the way a serverless, is this big enough? Oh, hey, you can't even see it, can you? Oh, wow. Close this. Sorry, I thought you guys could see what I was doing. There we go. Um, let me see if I can find the light turns off. That's hard to see. Oh, wow. Uh, hey, I didn't tell you at the beginning, usually I do, and this will help. I have a couple of rules while I'm speaking. Uh, rules are probably, it's probably strong, but this will help. Uh, first one is, this is any number I want it to be. So you guys have seen me already today going 6, or 5, or 92. So I hope one figure out when I say whatever number I want. It doesn't work well in restaurants. More, I, you know, I'm at the table for 7, I'm alone at the bar. So these are apostrophes, not quotes. I do this a lot. Uh, so so I, I, I'm sorry, these are quotes, not apostrophes. And these are thumbs. You'll see me do this too. So you see me doing that, that's kind of what I mean by that. But 
All right, so you all can see the code up here. So this is the basic idea of what a, a, a Lambda app or a service application looks like, okay? So in this, I've got my template file, which I talked earlier about my infrastructure as code. So this template file describes my application as an infrastructure. Let me just talk you through this real quick. First is I have a global section. It's not really important at the moment, but we'll talk about that a little more in a little while. The global section says, hey, for all functions, I want to make these certain settings. Um, but the main thing I've got here is I'm creating a bucket for all my audio files to be stored. That's all I have to do is just say create an audio bucket. This is the logical name and of the type, and it'll create the bucket. The second thing I'm doing is I'm creating the, the function, and I call this the process function. Okay, and, and, and the parts of this are, I tell what it is, so it's a function, where my code lies, which is under the process folder, okay, the timeout, I gave it 45 seconds because I knew it might take a while. Uh, normally, it's three is the standard that I do, seconds. And then I do policies. Now, policies are how we do security on, in SAM on Lambdas, okay? So these are managed policies, and we have a website that I'll give you a link to that show what I'm able to do is I'm able to say I want it to have DynamoDB CRUD policy, CRUD being create, read, update, delete, okay? Uh, and I pass it a table name. But I've noticed I'm not doing a hard-coded table name. I'm doing a reference to, a, to the table that's being created down here, okay? So in this, essentially what I'm getting is I'm saying, create a table, give me the name of it, and then I'll write a policy that lets me do create, read, update, delete from that table and that table only, and just this lambda. So it's very granular security inside of SAM. Someone was asking me earlier, how do we protect? This is how we do it. Okay, I can I can add different. This 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 particular lambda needs to um, read and write from Dynamo, read and write from S3 bucket, and then I'm doing a custom statement because I don't have a main statement and on on what I want it to be able to do with the with the different language uh, apps. The final thing I'm doing is I'm giving it the event. Remember, I told you when we build a service application, you have to have an event that triggers your lambda. And right in SAM, I can tell it what event that has to be. I'm telling it it should be an API. And you were asking me earlier how do I run this is how. And I'm going to show it to you in a second. It should be an API. And then I'm going to pass some properties. I can pass a lot more than this, but basically I'm giving it the, the, the path uh, that I want to do. And I could actually you know, put uh, you know, translate here. And it would actually use that path instead and then the method that it should do. I also globally enabled cores so that, my, so that it would be able to read and write uh, cross, cross domain. Some other things that I'm doing globally, uh, I do tell the type of runtime. I'm using node 810. Uh, I turned on, remember I said earlier, when we were talking about x-ray, I turned on x-ray. Uh, now, one thing to notice, I get a global handler on a timeout of three, but I overwrote it in the actual function of 40, uh, 45. All right, finally, uh, this is my table. Now, I'm doing some, really, in order to do a table, all this that's highlighted, I don't have to have. If I just pass these two lines, 69 and 70, it'll create a Dynamo TV with a ID of ID, and that's it. But I wanted to get, I wanted to be able to use that. Remember, I was talking about the hash and the range and everything like that. So I added those. And this sets sets all that up for me. Okay, so that's the template. Uh, again, I know that's, that's kind of a lot. As far as the code, let me show you what the code looks like. <clears throat> so it's about, it's not horrible. It's about 129 lines of code. Okay. And you can walk through this. This is the handler. Uh, I've got some. I've got some external functions. I, you know, here's the record creator. Here's the get translations. Here's the get audio. Here's the save audio. So I've done some different things there. So it kind of gives you an idea of, you know, what I'm doing. If you know Node at all, you can 
and I know I'm growing kind of fast, but that's that's how it does. I'm also including, <coughs> excuse me, I'm loading up some some different data that I need. I use my I have an AWS SDK. Now let's compare that to go into uh, my asynchronous. Now, now, now I have a bunch, each one of these folders is a lambda, okay? So one, like I said, there should be one, two, three, four, five. Now we have six, seven here. Uh, one is the sentiment that I added. I told you there were five, but there's actually six when we add sentiment and then my fetch, which you were asking me about. This is how I'm fetching that, that's is my client. So in the, in the original endpoint one, okay? I have 29 lines of code. And that's all it's doing is just writing code. Or it's, it's writing that data to the database really quick. So then the next one I do is a uh, translate one. And that's a little longer. It's got 43. You add these together, you probably have a little bit more because I am loading the dependencies multiple times. Um, but uh, does that make any questions on this? This is kind of what the code looks like behind the serverless application. I'd love to answer any questions or any observations. <clears throat> Nothing? Okay. Does it make sense or is it just like that? Ah, okay. Y'all can hear me? All right. Let's see. Okay. So, let's see what it actually built so you can kind of see it. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I keep clearing my throat. Okay, so the first thing, let's look at the API gateway, so you can kind of see that, see what's happening. So I'm in the Oregon region, because that's what this application is. Everything we do is, is region specific. Um, so you see, I've actually got two separate APIs. Um, so I have the translator async and the translator sync. And then and this is, of course, something else that I'm doing, we might look at later. When we go in here, you can actually see there's the resources that, and, and remember, it's just that simple line that said, in my event, create an API with a forward slash. That's all I put. And then and then enable cores, and it gave me an options endpoint. Uh, how many of y'all are familiar with cores that had to wrestle with cores? Okay. Cores is cross-origin resource scripting, I believe. I might be. And what that means is, and, and front-end development especially, do you some biggest headache in the world? And you want to put your head through a wall sometimes. But what it does is browsers are very specific about where they'll call data from. And, and so if I want to call, like if I'm on, you know, a front end that's, you know, mydomain.com and I'm calling a back end on mybackenddomain.com, I have to add some tags and some headers that have to happen. And API Gateway will handle that automatically. <clears throat> to a degree. You have to, I mean, like I just did simple. If you see in my course, uh, I just said, hey, let any domain and any header work. Probably not the same thing. I can go in and customize that to say just these specific domains. Uh, and I can do that through through the through same. So yeah, cores can be a real headache uh, and, it, and it can be a real challenge, but uh, it, it is a part of life that we have to deal with. <clears throat> okay, so on this you can see where you're posting. Uh, <coughs> guys, I'm sorry. All right, so uh, I'm posting. Uh, you can see the, the method request. Uh, you, I mean, I'm not going to go into all these, but you can see how the API gateway is doing. Here's the get function. Uh, there's, I have no uh, security record on it at the moment. If I wanted to add authorizers, I could. Um, I can I can add models. Yeah, I can do all kinds of things with uh, API Gateway. A lot of power there. So the second thing it creates is a DynamoDB table, and I have two tables that it created. I have the async table and the uh, sync table. So in the async here, you can go into the items. You can actually see them right away here. So there they are. Uh, and so, and this shows, uh, you know, how everything's set up. You can look at, 
Uh, you can even look at, it's kind of handy, um, when I go into the overview, here's my stream. Uh, if I if I were, if something were going bad and I had a loop or something really bad going on, I could go in here and manage the stream and I could disable that stream. So data would still continue to get written, okay? But it wouldn't, I, I wouldn't lose it all. I could, I could start it back up and then it would, then, then my system would continue. All right. Okay, and then and you've already seen the lambda. All right, so let's go back to the presentation. I want to, I want to talk about a couple of things. So, other advantages to building this way. Okay, and we're going to climb into more lambda, but what, what do you guys think? Throw, throw out what do you think. Do you see any advantages or disadvantages to building this way? It's reliable, but it's very reliable, but you have to repair the architecture for all this weird terms. So it's so if I understand it's it's reliable, but it's hard to repair that way. Okay. So truth to that. Um, that's why, but if you think about what we're doing infrastructure as code, rather than that's when you saw my template, I could just I, it is as simple as adding another template and deploying. So I manage that through the I agree with you. Enterprise applications are complex. I mean, there's just no way, there's no two ways about it. But, but the reliability of Cloud9 up and run. Well, okay, good. All right, anybody else getting Cloud9 up and run? Okay. Um, all right, but the thing about this is, and, and I agree with you, complexity sometimes when you're separating them out. The cool thing here is I could add another Lambda here, and his entire job would be to check my database for what exists versus what should exist, okay? So I can write in some self-healing application logic here that, that manages this, okay? Now this is a translation app, and, and, and the idea behind it is we're actually writing it for a, a, muse, uh, or for a zoo. And we wanted them to be able to put in text uh, and have it like, hey, welcome to the panda bear enclosure, you know, and then it would put it out in any language they could print it and have a button that you play, okay? So as people put it in, we want to be, we want to be able to say, okay, is everything there that should be there? So I could again, I could write a lambda that scans. And so uh, one of the things in this and it's written into this database is when this translate, the very first lambda after the event bridge, when translate hits the event or hits the translate API, if it fails, I still write back to the data. I write a record to the data, but in the translation text. Or I could add a separate error field, I write the word error. That's simple. Okay. Then what I can do is I can scan the database once an hour looking for errors, and then I can do some self-healing. Okay, try again. If it doesn't work, then let's notify somebody. So reliability, hugely reliability. Complex, yeah, it adds some complexity. But that's our job, right? I mean, when, when, when people talk to us as developers, we can't push back and go, yeah, that's, that's too Reliability, look, I want simplicity in building. Now, I believe that this is simpler than a lot than building in you know, some, of the, some of the frameworks that we have to build in, especially in monolithic. But the reliability part is huge. So, yeah. Uh, what about the reliability of the number of the Which is the main point, which it is. broke and broke everything. Yep. So, DynamoDB, um, it is an SLA. Don't quote me on this, but I have to look it up. And I believe it's 99.99 uptime, uh, percentage of uptime. And so that's that's availability. So let's, let's talk about important metrics. The two we are thinking about is available and durable, right? Okay. So availability says, hey, I can get to my data. Okay. Durability says, hey, my data still exists. Okay. And, and you, you ask which is going to make the customer mad. You come to a customer and go, hey, you can't get to your data right now, about an hour you'll be able to get to it. They're going to be mad, but they're going to survive. You come to your customer and say, hey, we you lost your data. That's a whole different story, isn't it? Right? So the first thing about that in ODB, again, the durability is we write, when, when AWS 
sets up their architecture, we have we have several things to think about. We have what's called a region. Okay, and a region will have multiple AZs, okay, availability zones. So a region will have three plus availability zones. US East, the, the first one that they did has like seven availability zones. Okay. An availability zone is not one data center, it's multiple data centers that are interconnected to provide uptime and redundancy. Now, when we when you're on a lambda, your lambdas and your well, I'm sorry, let's go back to DynamoDB. When you're in DynamoDB, when you write that data, it's going to write it in three availability zones in two different places. Okay, so durability is incredibly strong. It also is backed up frequently to S3, which is, has 11 nines. So 99.9999, I've already lost count. That many of the nines uh, of a percentage up top. It's, it's the highest SLA you can find, right? Um, and so that's, that's the durability part. The availability part says I'm, my data, if I lose a data center, I'm still up and running. Uh, even if I lose, uh, you can do one of the cool things you really need. So, so let's say in your head you're thinking, okay, that's great. Three data centers are in one region. That's where my data is written. What if that whole region, God forbid, gets blown up? Okay? And I don't mean blown up like a bomb. I mean, uh, uh, I don't know, something bad. I'm not trying to introduce you know, something scary here. But we lose a whole region, right? Number one, your data is still safe. But you're like, yeah, but I need availability. DynamoDB offers something called global tables, multi-master global tables. So what happens is when I write to this, it uses strings to automatically sync to another region. And it, and it syncs it up. So I can write here and I can write here and it syncs them up. Okay? And so you have global, so let's say I, I'm doing that in US East 1 and EU in, in Frankfurt, EU uh, East 1. Okay, so I have data both there. So so uh, US East goes down, Frankfurt's still running. Okay, so maybe some interruption on people trying to get to the data. Data's still there, but then it'll, it'll start traversing over there as well. So hopefully that answers your question of, yeah, that is a linchpin, but durability is incredibly high there. Yeah? Uh, what if Amazon DynamoDB will send RAM? So maybe the it will push RAM to another place, but it will be not available. Right, so so first of all, DynamoDB is not doing the same to stream, to stream uh, or I'm sorry, charging a stream reader. I, I, I see what you're saying. So you're asking, what if the lambda is not available? Lambda or something later after the. Right, okay. Right, okay. So the delay, it will sit in the stream until something is grabbed and said, yeah, I got it. And you, it, yeah, so yeah, it'll stay in that stream. And the stream is backed by Kinesis, which I was talking about earlier. And Kinesis is, is multi-redundant as well. So not just the data that is stored in Dynamo, but in the stream is multi-redundant. The data will fail back to DynamoDB, which that the received the match. And from this time, it will the possibility of Right, right. So, so, okay. So, great question. So, your your basic question is, what happens when things break? Well, yeah, right. So, and that's why this is more reliable. There does come a point. It's like, man, we try really hard not to lose data. But so, so that's why the very first thing I'm doing is write the original to Dynamo. Okay. So I have that original data that everything else is built on. Okay. But you're right. So I go to Stream Reader and a bit bridges down. Okay. And Stream Reader tries to fire it. So, so here's, there's two things to look at in the Lambda. So one is the Lambda service. Did the Lambda service execute the function properly and get a 200 back? That's going to happen almost every time, 99.997, I think. All right, those numbers I don't remember well. But the second part of that is, did your code execute properly? Whereas Lambda, the function, the service did what it was supposed to do, but your code was not as good as it should be, you know. Not mine, of course. Mine's perfect. I tested production. But your code, I can tell you're not no, I'm just kidding. You're probably a much better coder than I am. But then if your code failed, well, that's up to you to deal with the error code, right? So you gotta go, ah, I failed, so let's let's try this again. Uh, let's let's write out a, a let's write something to CloudWatch. Let's let's 
post an alert, and then and then we'll we'll alert off that and grab it. Let's write the let's write the data out to an SQS queue just somewhere, uh, something like that. But if 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 uh, Lambda tries to if, if the service tries to do it and dies, it will then retry. There's a retry error of uh, I don't remember the exact I can get the documentation, but it's like 24 hours will it will retry several times, and then hold on to that. Um, if that doesn't work, then, then you can drop it into what's called a DL queue, a dead letter queue. And it's just a queue that sits there and collects data that something happened to. And then you can read that data. So there's a lot of, of, of uh, redundancy built in to help you not, not lose that. Um, but at any point, so, so here in, in step one, we gather the data in DynamoDB, we have the original. Step two happened fine, we wrote the data back, but step three crashed. Well, that's all right. We've got step one and step two. So we've got all the data we need to recreate step three. It's almost like an event sourcing pattern, if you're familiar with that. Rather than, yes, and that's the way the data is written is these event sourcing, rather than and I'm constantly writing rather than updating. Um, so it's, it's a good pattern to be able to play back if I need to. Uh, does that answer your question? All right. Okay. All right. Who controls the process? Good question. Let me get a drink. So, as far as firing the land, okay, you hit API. You, well, let's just start from the beginning. You call the API. You control the call, obviously. Yeah. Uh, AWS gets a, AWS's job is to make sure. API can get what it does what it's supposed to do and pass it to Lambda and trigger the Lambda. Okay? So, so we're, we control the execution of the Lambda, not the code inside the Lambda. We just say the service itself will execute and get a 200. Okay? Your Lambda will execute and hopefully get a 200 as well, or maybe something else based on what your code does. Okay? Moving forward, writing to DynamoDB. You're in control of the writing of the DB. We have an SDK you use, and the Lambda will, will make those calls, but you have to be the right code to write that into that on DB. As far as storing your durability, we're in control of that. Okay? We're going to store that data. Also triggering the stream, having it drop into the stream and trigger the next Lambda, will control that. Okay? So that takes us to Stream Reader. So we so that so we've controlled, once you've dropped it to Dynamo, we'll make sure the, the, the Stream Reader happens. Now, every once in a while, you might go, well, it didn't trigger. Got to make sure you have permissions for it to trigger. Okay? Permissions are all about everything. So one of the things you saw when I was showing the, 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 the read and write, there's and making sure that, that uh, the when, and, and if I write in there, if I want this to trigger this, same law, when I was showing the same template, that will handle it. But if you were doing it by hand for some reason, you got to make sure that's in place. Okay? Um, once I hit stream reader, again, we'll invoke the service, your code runs, you go to event bridge. Now, after that, so as far as tra translate getting triggered, it all depends on the rules. I said I would show you the rules. Let me show you that. So the idea of the rules, and mine are, mine are very, very simple, actually. I'm going to show you in the, uh, actually in the SAM template on how that works. So, where am I? Change letter receipt back in. Okay, in the template, stream function, transit function. Okay, so here's the event. Okay, this says this is what I want to trigger this lambda. This particular lambda is the one that looks for translation calls. Okay, in this, he says the type is a CloudWatch event, so he knows what's going to happen. He's, that automatically ties him into CloudWatch. Then he says, here's the pattern I want you to look at. The source should be DB stream, and the detail type should be translation. Now, if you notice in my stream reader, I'm actually writing, there's, this is actually the, the, this is the function that builds the event. I write out a source, and everything's DB stream. So that, makes, that basically ties it to this application. And then I write out the, uh, uh, what else did I say? Oh, the detail type, sorry. And then the detail type, I pass in the type to match which one I need. 
Okay, so that's how I make sure. Everybody kind of makes sense, or y'all glossing on this? Glossing means glazing over, like, hey, we don't care anymore. That's all right. Okay. So that's how I make sure I'm in control of what events will get triggered by what through event bridge. Amazon is in control of piping those through. Yes, sir. Sorry. Yeah. Not clear. Okay. If Amazon to play the download service right now, will translate uh, down the, uh, the drive we get in the end, the response again and again by itself? Or it, it will just return the error code and then. It'll return the error and you have to and you have to do it. Because that's an yeah. it, 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 <coughs> my logic in the application yes. to deal with. That's right. That's exactly what you hear that. That you said you're asking back there. But so you're kind of in translate servers or some sort of tool. Uh, I went back through all Memphis, which was so in this service. Yeah. So let me explain to make sure I understand. So that's right. So your code is going to call Amazon Translate. Okay. For some reason, Amazon Translate is not available. So you're going to get a 400 or a 500, depending instead of a standard 200, okay? So what your code has to do is it sums up something wrong. Because it could be translate, it could be translate, could be your code, you know, something like that. It could be that you did like the wrong, you were given the wrong parameters and fired back. But if translate does not exist, then you would have to deal with the error in your in your code. And so what you, my recommendation is write back to the database anyway and say, about an error or an error here. And then later, you can pull that and say, all right, let's try it again. All right, now we've tried twice now, let's write out an error. Or you can write an error right away. So, but that would be something you would handle in your code. Is that, is that clarifying enough? I don't want to just talk to you, everybody. Any questions on that? All right, did that clarify you guys? Okay, okay, okay. all right. If you have that, uh, I'm gonna take your hands for now, look, but I'm not sure I believe you. <laughs> Which is okay, I'm all right with that. Uh, okay, so does that kind of help understand who controls what? You control a lot of what goes on in service. When we say service, we really just deal with the, their services, their managed services, right? And you take part of the services. Sometimes you control the infrastructure that's set in them, like, like a Lambda or an event bridge or stream reader. Sometimes it's just a service you call, like a, like a translator or a comprehender or a phone. A lot of control here, no servers to manage. That's service. Kind of, kind of in a nutshell. If you, if you go away with nothing, you kind of get that idea. Um, and that's and that's serverless whether you're on AWS or GCP or Azure or IBM. Um, that's all we're offering right now. But uh, there's, I mean, obviously they're not the same service names, but that's the idea. Okay. Anybody interested in starting to do something like this? Okay, a couple of you. All right. Any of you looking at it and going, that's too hard? All right. Okay. Or any of you looking at it and going, my company will never take that. That's, some, that's something we see as well. Yeah. So, all right. What other questions can I answer before we move on? We're coming up on, I think we might do an early lunch. Uh, let me get this. Can all of you check to see if you can get into your account? Still not doing it. I see some frustration shaking heads. It's not functioning, so I'll open it up now. Okay, all right. Well, well, nine is open, but I'm in here. So cloud nine is all you really need. Okay. Yeah, so still not there. 
Anybody able to create cloud nine? You were able to create cloud nine, right? Were you able to create cloud nine instance? Yeah. Okay. Should Yeah, you're in. you were not. You're in. Okay. Anybody else cloud nine? All right. So, all right. Well, okay. So here's what I think we're going to do. If you don't have any questions, and anything else I can answer. All right. So. What I've got, I could talk all day. I just don't want to bore you guys. Okay, anybody bored yet? Be honest with me. I figured some of you'd be honest. All right, good. They're not bored. All right. So what I think we'll do is uh, let's end this, and then I'm going to have them. I'm going to tell them we're going to go ahead and do lunch. Y'all hungry? I'm hungry. And then I will get the next thing set up, and then let's see if we can do. Yeah, again, and I want to stress, if you, did, if you didn't catch this one I said earlier, if we don't get to the workshops today, you can do it at home. They are absolutely self-driven. And you walk through and they'll tell you exactly what to do. You won't have me here to answer questions, but I'll give you my, well, you've got my Twitter here. Hit me up. I answer. Sometimes it's like, hey, it's the middle of the night here. Leave me alone. But most of the time, it's like, yeah, I want to answer that because I'd love to be the guy that answer questions. So... Uh, if for some reason we can't do the workshops, don't sweat it. You'll still have access to the workshops. I won't take them down. They're on my actual uh, my GitHub, and you can just walk right through them. Um, the, the, the workshop that we're going to do is called Wild Rides. Like I said, we call the unicorns. It's a standard AWS one that we do. So, so getting support on it's not hard. So we can we can definitely. And, and before we go, I'll explain exactly which ones to do. Make make sense? All right, I'll call her and tell her, hey, we're ready to do lunch. Because um, it's too late to start. I don't want to start another session yet, but I've got I've got some other sessions we can walk through. Hey there, we are. I think we're ready to do lunch. If you guys are ready, does that does that work? Okay, sounds good. So I'll put this up if you guys want to real quick. So that if you want to mess around with the application, uh, the translation application, this bit.ly or anywhere it's mobile uh, as well. Let me take a QR code. Love to get your feedback, see if you can break it. Uh, you probably will. It's, you know, I, I didn't put a lot of redundancy into it, but it's, it's it should be fairly uh, fairly solid. So that's the serve dash translate is the one that, that I've been doing it. Uh, one thing I will show you here. She's going to come down in just a minute here. So remember, I said how easy would it be to add just another service? If you go in here on the asynchronous, see here the sentiment neutral. So on this one, it's uh, it's that, and I can put in here. Uh, hang on a sec. Let's create new. Let's translate this to everything. So notice that the uh, the need the it doesn't have. There it is. I got a positive. What's up? All right. All right. Now uh, I need I need a volunteer. Come up here for a second. Come on, somebody come up. Uh, come on, yeah, yeah, I knew it would be you. Come on. Tell me your name. Wislaw. Tell it to me slowly. Wislaw. 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 There it is. I don't hear very well. All right. Type something in Russian here. Did you 
can. I don't know if my keyboard will do it to you, but so. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> All right, we'll grab some Russian and cut and paste it. We'll do that. So the way this works, yeah, that makes more sense. Sorry. Okay, let's see if we can find. Oh, here. We'll just take one along here too. So the way this this works, it's kind of cool. Okay. All right. I'll, I'll miss you, Vlad. Okay. <laughs> So, I haven't actually tried this. I'm pretty sure that I wrote it this way, but let's try it. So now we're doing Russian, and I want uh, English US. Okay, let's translate. <laughs> Boom. So this uses in the background, I can set the language that I want to translate from, but I actually went a step further, and I told it to check comprehend, use the comprehend service that we offer. Take the original phrase, tell me what language it is. So now I can pass any language in. Maybe not any language, but like 30 or 40, a lot of them. And, and it'll translate to any other language. A lot of control, uh, the way the services work. Um, very cool service in, in, anybody work on, I think you did training stuff, right? Uh, anybody working on like customer service type uh, applications? Yeah. Okay. All right. We we have an application that we wrote where uh, customer service where we use Penpoint, which is our phone service. You can connect in, and as people are talking, we do we translate it to text automatically, and then it automatically checks it to see hey they're happy or sad. It has this little meter. So they they're pretty mad at you. What do they like you? Hey, they're mad. They're neutral. That kind of stuff. So it's kind of helpful for customer service because they say, oh, okay, I need I need to take care of it. So. Just kind of fun, and, and it's all streaming. So, yeah. Uh, whether you, you know. Uh, I want to see if the English plays. Hey, I love you. You're the best. Everything is great. And let's see if we got the sentiment. Yeah, see, it read the sentiment off the Russian as well. All right. Any questions on that? Any questions on how you can do this better or what I can do? Any comments? Come on, developers out there. What would you change? What, what's the main, main advantage uh, like creating web applications? Like, on the web I see, I see like uh, managing infra infra infrastructure. Yeah, yeah. And maybe a lot of services. Amazon service like uh, translate and like that. Okay. So what's the advantage to, to yeah. Yeah. Oh, because like what that's the, I can I can I can read with the application yeah. with two clicks like in dot net or Java. Okay. It's, it's easy nowadays. So yeah, I don't don't see the advantages. Alright, so uh, actually that's a great question. Okay. So if I understand my repeat back to the sure. Why would I go to AWS? If I can do this right in .NET, okay. Some of this you can't do directly in .NET. You use a service, right? Translation service, something like that. So the reason, so let me tell you kind of how you do this approach. Okay. So first of all, we were infrastructure. Infrastructure is a service, mm -hmm. right? And we don't we don't classify ourselves as an IS provider, but that is one of the things we do, right? So we came in and said, look, you do the code, we'll give you the infrastructure to build. It. Okay. But one of the things. What you'll notice is our roadmap on almost everything we built is directly dependent on what customers tell us they need. Hey, we really need this. Hey, we really need this. And one of the things is the, is the need for machine learning or artificial intelligence without having to write it. You know what I mean? So, hey, I need to be able to do a quick translation. All right, well, here's an API to do. Google has, has one also. You know, you can do their APIs. Right, so I need to do change uh, text to voice or go the other way, voice to text. Okay, so and, and rather than and, and yes, so I don't know the language that do them internally, like .NET itself won't it use the search, right? Uh, but it's not part of the framework. I'm, I'm asking, I'm not sure. So, what's yeah, that? Again, again, your question. Yeah. So, oh, I see. So if I'm doing .NET, 
right in the framework, I can't translate text. Right? I use a service. Uh, yeah. to do it. Right, okay, yeah. So and so this is a service to do it. But the, the reason is so so building on top of that, we also have a thing called SageMaker, which actually does machine learning that you can actually train it, but it does it in this style. And you, I mean, it really brings machine learning to those of us, like me, who don't understand machine learning. It allows us to have the power of that without having to understand what you know the notebooks are and what all the you know the, all the kinds of things are. Uh, but you can get deep into machine learning on on it as well. The reason we say use AWS instead of something else like a Google or or service like that is one, we have it all together in one application or one one cloud service, right? So it's all together. We've been doing we've been doing it longer than any of the other. We have the broadest, and this is this is not me just quoting marketing facts, it's fact. You go and look at, at, at the, the dashboard, uh, and, and you'll see our services are much broader. Uh, I, Google is an amazing company building amazing cloud. Microsoft, amazing, building amazing cloud, but they're not near as far as we are. In fact, Google's, um, uh, I'm a developer advocate, that's my role. Their name of developer advocate, his name is, is Kelsey Hightower, super smart guy. You know who I'm talking about? Have you heard the name? Okay. Anyway, he's the one who made the other, earlier I was talking about the, the custom runtime layer in COBOL. He's the one that did it. Because he wanted to try out AWS Lambda. And even he said, this is the gold standard. These guys are knocking out of the park on what they're doing. So, and I know it just sounds like you're just doing a big marketing pitch, and that's not what I'm trying to do. But the advantage with us is you have more services. Uh, they're automatically all under our security umbrella. So you're, the, the IAM, the, the Identity and Access Management, is going to apply to all of them. You don't have to go to this company for this service, this company for this service. Do their security here, do their security here. It's all rolled into ours. Our SDK interfaces with all of them. So if you're using .NET, .NET SDK is going to be able to interface with all of them. No Python, Java, whatever. Um, also, the reliability and redundancy that we built in. Um, we, 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 I'm not going to say we don't put down, everything goes down. Uh, we, build for, we build for reliability. Here about a year, and I, you guys have met, may have never heard of it. Do you have Netflix here in Russia? <laughs> you, okay, you watch. I know it's a dumb question, but I never know. So you have Netflix, okay? So Netflix, um, this is a great story. So about a year and a half ago, S3, our, our, the, the one I was talking about earlier, Part of it went down. What do you do? You just, and it come, come to find out someone fat fingered, literally, where they hit the wrong button. And rather than doing two things, they did 9,200 9, things. And it took, took part of it down, not all of it. Because remember, we're, we're segregated in regions and availability zones. Problem is, it was one of the major ones. And, and we had people all over the place saying, oh, Netflix went down, or, or oh, S3 went down, everything like that. Netflix uses S3 for a lot of their stuff. And they use servers for a lot of their stuff. They never went down. Because they were in different, they were duplicating, like we talked about, out to different regions. Okay, our infrastructure is crazy solid. And, and, we, and we, we have high, high maintain building, high recommendations for building out. I don't know if that answers your question. I mean, I can continue to tell you things, but yeah. the advantages are, are just that, you know. So, and, am I missing the question, or does that make sense? I'm fine. So it's more more about like public services. So you, you can't like create uh, yeah create services or inside your company without like internet or something like that. Okay, yeah, so you can't no you can't run AWS locally. Uh, no, it's it is a cloud and it's and it's designed that way. That's not a you don't do it even even for like the corporation. So we don't, we tie in, I'll tell you what we do do, and we see it a lot, um, is we tie in, uh, we do hybrid. We don't do it, mm -hmm. our customers do it. So we're just cloud, that's all we do. But okay. our, our customers will build hybrid uh, architectures that have some on-premise. On because mm -hmm. one of the things, and I know you deal with it here in Russia, is data sovereignty, meaning data has to stay here. It has to be here, not somewhere else. And so what they'll do is they'll store their data in a local data center and then do the compute 
out on AWS, like through serverless or EC2, yeah. which is virtual, um, and they'll do that out on the cloud, and they'll have a direct connect big old fat pipe to handle that. Um, but uh, but the bottom line is no, we we don't do on-premise architecture. We just do cloud architecture. <clears throat> but this service here is is a you know I'm committed now. I am not. I don't have any. You can all go out and play with this because I haven't done any authorization. I could. I go out and slap it on there, then you have to log in to do it. Um, but it is, you know, it's like it's it's HTTPS, you know, it's, it is your socket. I could tie it down so that it's authenticated. So I could, and then I could run it and I could access it through a VPN, right? So I could really lock it down and make it just usable for my customers. And people who do like the customer service one I was talking about earlier, they would do something like that. This is open for anybody. Yeah? What about that? Yeah, yeah. No is the answer. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. Sorry, I realized, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, read all your data. No. No, we do not have access. So the top things that we that we work with uh, are the, the top priorities are security and privacy. And so Amazon, and AWS is part of Amazon, we don't read anything. We don't look at anything. Now, you have seen in the news uh, things like Alexa or been listening to you, things like that. The way Alexa works is, is um, you say, hey, Alexa, and then it comes on and then it listens to you. And yes, it sends that data to the cloud to analyze and use the machine learning you've seen up here, and then it responds. And there, in, in the, in the, uh, the, the checkbox, you know, the use drive, it says we will, we will learn from that, so we'll improve that. But you can opt out of that. Other than that, we don't read data in your S3 buckets. We don't read data. We don't have access to it. It's not that we just don't. We don't have access to it. You can actually, if you want to say, hey, look, um, I want to make sure. There's a couple things you can do. You're like, look, Eric, that's great. I love what you're saying, but I don't believe a word of what you're saying. So I'm going to make sure. Number one, you can encrypt all your data. And you can encrypt it you know, before, you, before you put it in. Now, we have some tooling that allow you to do encryption at all times. DynamoDB. Not up there. If it were there, I'm pointing at it. DynamoDB is automatically encrypted at rest and in train, in train as it's transferring out. So that automatically happens, happens, and it can be a rolling key. But you can set it up where you manage the keys and we never even see them, or you can put it in our service literally so that it is managed. And when I say we, I mean our automated system. I don't mean I'm there going, you know, I don't, I'm not doing that. But if you still think, you know, that's not that's not good enough. You can actually encrypt it as it's going in. We don't read data. Right. In fact, we encourage folks to encrypt their data. Uh, if the government came to us, and, and this, this is true, if the government came to us and said, hey, uh, for criminal reasons or whatever, we need to read that. Okay? What we would do, this is how we approach that. It's, and sometimes, you know, it depends on the country that and stuff like that. Sometimes we have to abide by rules like that. We, if at all possible, we notify the plan first. Hey, we've been requested to show that data. Um, but we, we tell everybody we encrypt your data. Because if the government came to us and said, hey, we want to read that, like, there it is. Good luck reading it. But how does it manage it? Because if you, if you keep my data for your cloud, then you have access to all the memory of data from the other. And so, so all secret from it. Yeah. So I have access to your. I still don't read this, but we're talking about code versus data, right? And you're right, the data goes through the code. You're right, and we don't look at that, we don't touch that. So uh, again, if you want to be secure, you could, I mean, this is obviously extreme. You could you could encode a client side and push it that way. You know, yeah. so that, that's obviously, you know, and, and obviously using TLS, SSL. I can't process in Lambda, so uh, I can You would have to unencrypt, it. yeah, exactly. So How you get that data? Yeah, 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 you're right. So, so I mean, yeah, I, and this is where you have to, where I have to go. You gotta trust me on this one. We don't, we don't analyze. We don't, we don't look at any. We don't read the data going in and out. We don't read the packets. We don't, we don't do anything like that. Uh, and, and we, we have dozens of documents saying it, and dozens of clients. I mean, in, in in the U.S. and this may not mean a lot here, but in the U.S., CIA uses it, and that's something. I'm not telling you any secrets. That's something that they'll tell you. Um, we have Department of Defense. We have you know, different people who use this because of our stance on security and privacy. We absolutely don't read data. 
and we go to the to the end to, to not to not read that at all. So uh, hopefully that answers your question. That's about the best answer you can get to. I mean, I wish I could do more than we don't, but we don't. And then there's a lot of the security you can wrap around where you control the keys, you control the encryption keys. So I definitely know if you're there something. Thank <laughs> you. 